Hello everyone. It's time for us to move from Europe to cross the English Channel and look at the English Reformation, which is quite a story as you will see. But before we talk about the Reformation, I want to talk about how we got the English Bible because this is a beautiful and inspiring story with uh, people that are worthy of our admiration. Uh, so let's begin with someone we've looked at before, namely John Wycliffe, uh, who's known as the Morning Star of the Reformation uh, because of his influence on John Huss and uh, later on Martin Luther uh, and later than that on the English reformers and his life dates as you know are in the 1300s so he's actually active about 150 years before Martin Luther. Now we've spoken of John Wycliffe before as part of the background of the Reformation so I will move quickly through his, uh, his facts. We know that he was a professor at Oxford University. Oxford University was the greatest of the theology and philosophy schools, and he was the most respected of their professors. Uh, he had it as his uh, practice uh, as a priest of the Lutterworth Parish Church that he would teach through the Bible, and we've talked about how uh, expository preaching through the Bible uh, can bring about renewal and reform. Now he taught that scripture is the ultimate authority, not the traditions of the church. And so uh, in this uh, way, uh, he went against the papacy and their claims that only the church uh, and only the pope can, uh, can interpret scripture and uh, and, and teach uh, ecclesiastical doctrine and practice. He also taught that the state had the authority to reform the church, but remember that during his lifetime, uh, the papacy was undergoing its one of its lowest ebbs, the Avignon papacy, when the pope was under the control of the French king uh, and headquarters located in Avignon, France. Remember also that England was at war with France during the Hundred Years' War at this time. And even after the Avignon papacy ended and uh, Pope Gregory XI moved uh, his headquarters back to Rome, shortly after that we have the Great Papal Schism where uh, Clement VII moved his uh, anti-pope uh, regime back to Avignon while Urban VI maintained his headquarters in Rome. So we have a corrupt uh, papacy, we have a broken papacy, and so it, was, it seemed natural to Wycliffe and others that the state should intervene in the local church. And this brought about a great popularity for Wycliffe among the nobility and royalty of England. Now, he went one more step and denied the doctrine of transubstantiation. You know, this doctrine that the bread and wine literally transform into the body and blood of Christ. Uh, when he denied this doctrine, which after all was not in scripture and again had become uh, Catholic dogma only in the previous century, uh, Wycliffe lost the support of the nobility and so he was uh, vulnerable to trial. He was put on trial for heresy. Fortunately, uh, the queen supported him and uh, would not allow his execution, but nonetheless, he was removed from his post at Oxford, losing uh, access to the library, uh, losing his ministry of teaching. 
He was placed under house arrest and the only ministry open to him was the priesthood at Lutterworth. But it was during this time that Wycliffe uh, came upon the work that uh, has made him most memorable, and that is uh, his decision to translate the Bible into English. Now, he chose to translate the Bible from the Latin Vulgate into the language of his people. And do you recognize the flaw in that approach? Well, yes, uh, he's translating a translation. And so he's, he's not uh, using the original languages. But remember, this is uh, a century before uh, Erasmus and his edition of the Greek New Testament. And so the, the original manuscripts in Greek and Hebrew simply were not available to him. And so he did the best he could with what he had. And so I admire him for his desire and his work and that of his followers in making the Bible available in English. An English Bible translated from the Vulgate is better than no English Bible at all. The problem was that it took one person nearly a year to transcribe one copy of the Bible and these translations were banned and copies were destroyed by the Catholic Church so they could be burned much more quickly than they could be transcribed. But Wycliffe and his followers worked hard to make available uh, the Word of God in English. <coughs> now, the, uh, uh, the Catholic Church was adamantly opposed to the English Bible or any other translation of the Bible. And so uh, Wycliffe was uh, criticized greatly. This uh, statement comes from a Catholic historian and is dated 1408. So this is after Wycliffe's death. But listen to what uh, this person had to say. Christ gave his gospel to the clergy and the learned doctors of the church so that they might give it to the laity and to weaker persons. But this master John Wycliffe translated the gospel from Latin into the English, the Angle, not the angel language. All right, I'll grant a good little bit of rhetoric to that. And Wycliffe made it the property of the masses and common to all, and even to women, oh no, who were able to read Oh, my word. And so the pearl of the gospel is thrown before swine and trodden underfoot. And what is meant to be the treasure, both of clergy and laity, is now become a joke of both. So you can see the Catholic Church took very seriously their claim to uh, be the uh, proprietors of the scriptures and its only interpreters. Now, John Wycliffe was never condemned, and so when he died, he died in communion with the church and was buried in the churchyard at Lutterworth. But uh, after his death at the Council of Pisa, he was condemned along with John Huss. And then in 1428, the Pope ordered that his uh, remains be exhumed and his bones were burned and his ashes scattered. Again, we've talked before about how the church felt that burning uh, was symbolic, not only of the destruction of the heretic, but the destruction of the heresy. But listen to what uh, one of uh, Wycliffe's biographers, a poet, had to say about uh, John Wycliffe's ashes. He said, they burnt his bones to ashes and cast them into the swift, a neighboring brook running hard by. Thus the brook hath conveyed his ashes into Avon, Avon into Severn, 
Severn into the narrow seas, and they into the main ocean. And thus the ashes of Wycliffe are the emblem, or the symbol of his doctrine. And just as the ashes spread around the world, uh, on, born on the waters, so his doctrine is dispersed the world over. And so poetically, through this metaphor, uh, this poet biographer has affirmed that Wycliffe's teachings went around the world. And we know that uh, he influenced John Huss. We've already talked about his influence on uh, the English Reformation. Uh, and after Wycliffe, the next major translator of the English Bible was William Tyndale, known as God's outlaw. And even though he was considered an outlaw in his day, uh, I have uh, seen this statue in London, which acknowledges uh, his, uh, his redemption in the eyes of England and uh, his honor given to him today. Denied to him in his lifetime. Now, William Tyndale, you see his life dates there, so he was born more than a hundred years after Wycliffe's death, but he was educated at Cambridge. Cambridge was a kind of a hotbed of uh, Reformation and spiritual revolution. And uh, after his graduation, he did not accept uh, a a position as a priest but became a private tutor. Uh, he was shocked by the clergy's ignorance of scripture because back then even many of the priests were unable to read Latin and therefore they could not know what they were teaching and preaching. They simply were uh, repeating by rote Latin words that they had learned one night at dinner, uh, the family where he was uh, tutoring the children uh, hosted a priest. And as they had conversation, Tyndale uh, realized the ignorance of the house guest. And he said, if God spares my life before many years pass, I will see to it that a plowboy will know more of the scripture than you do. So he desired to translate the Bible into English from Hebrew and Greek, not from the Latin Vulgate. So do you see the improvement in Tyndale's approach over Wycliffe's approach? Tyndale had the linguistic ability to translate from Hebrew and Greek, and also he had access to Erasmus's critical edition of the Greek New Testament. And so he had the tools uh, to translate the Bible from the original languages into English. In 1524, he sought permission from Cuthbert Tunstall the Bishop of London to do exactly that. But when the Bishop learned that Tyndale desired to make this English translation available to the laity, he refused permission. This was seven years after Luther had nailed his uh, 95 theses to the door, three years after he had taken his stand at Worms, and uh, Lutheranism was spreading its ideals uh, around the world and was uh, influencing England. And so the bishop feared uh, these Lutheran ideas, and so he did not want uh, an English Bible that would help Lutheranism make more inroads into England uh, against the English Catholic Church. So he denied permission to Tyndale, and Tyndale then sailed for Germany. There he completed his New Testament. He smuggled 6,000 copies of his New Testament into England, where they became a hit with the booksellers, as you can imagine. 
uh, the bishop, Bishop Tunstall, uh, found these English Bibles and he bought all that he could so that he could burn them and take them out of circulation. What he didn't realize is that by purchasing them, he was funding the uh, royalties that were going to Tyndale back in Germany. And so Tyndale took the bishop's money and used it to create a second edition. Uh, Tyndale began the Old Testament and completed the Pentateuch, but uh, the bishop had his final revenge on uh, Tyndale. Uh, the bishop hired a scoundrel named Henry Phillips. Uh, Phillips was the second son of an English nobleman, and as you know, a second son receives no inheritance. And so how is he going to earn a living? And so he became a gambler and a thief and was subject to arrest. But the bishop called him in and offered him an opportunity to escape prison, and that was to travel to Europe, uh, specifically to Belgium, where Tyndale was residing at the time. Phillips must find Tyndale and uh, spy on him and ultimately betray him to the authorities, leading to Tyndale's arrest. And so that's what Phillips did. He uh, found Tyndale, he pretended to be his friend, and uh, even on the way to Tyndale's capture, uh, Phillips uh, borrowed two pounds uh, from his friend knowing that he would never have to pay back the debt. And so he led Tyndale into the waiting arms of the soldiers. Tyndale was arrested. He was imprisoned then for a year and a half and uh, ultimately was executed. First they strangled him and then his body was burned at the stake. His final words were recorded. His words were, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. So this was his final prayer, that the Lord would open up the eyes of the King of England, who at the time was Henry VIII, so that the king would uh, allow the translation of the Bible into English and make it available to the English people. Well, the answer to Tyndale's prayer was not far behind. Uh, his friend Miles Coverdale completed Tyndale's translation of the Old Testament, and in 1535, uh, Coverdale published the first complete English Bible. And by 1536, this Bible was printed in England under the king's license. And so what made the difference was that, as we're going to see, Henry VIII led the Church of England to separate from the Roman Catholic Church. And so Henry, at that time, was more amenable to the idea of an English Bible. Now, after Coverdale's translation, John Rogers uh, issued a translation based on the work by Tyndale and Coverdale, but he issued it under the name of Thomas Matthew, thinking that a pseudonym might help him to hide his identity. So, thanks to Tyndale uh, and his associates Coverdale and Rogers, uh, we have English Bibles uh, being published and circulated in England and under the king's license. In 1539, the Great Bible is produced. Henry VIII uh, approved this Bible, known as the Great Bible because of its size, and he ordered this Bible to be placed in every parish church. Of course, it had to be chained down, so valuable that it would uh, be stolen. But you can see from the illustration the size of this Bible. So we admire William Tyndale for his talent and for his hard work 
in producing an English New Testament and Pentateuch, he started a great work, even though it cost him his very life. And his associates continued the work, and then the Lord answered his prayer. And so now we have an English Bible, and it's going to have a tremendous impact on the way the church goes forward in England. Now, there were other English translations that followed close after. The Geneva Bible was produced in 1560. This was translated by English Puritans who had uh, sought refuge in Geneva, Switzerland from the persecutions of their Catholic monarch, Mary Tudor. We'll talk more about uh, Mary and her persecution later, but uh, nonetheless, this Geneva Bible was very influential, not only among the English Puritans, but among those Puritans who traveled to uh, the, new, the New World and settled in colonial America. Geneva Bible was the most popular Bible among the pilgrims and Puritans of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The Bishop's Bible was the official church, I mean, I'm sorry, the official Bible of the Church of England. It was the successor to the great Bible. And then finally, the Catholics decided they needed to get with the program, and so they published the Dewey Reims Bible in 1610. It was translated from the Latin Vulgate because they didn't want to get too far away from uh, the official uh, Catholic Bible. Well, let me conclude by just uh, uh, reminding us of the theological contributions of the English Bible. Uh, this laid the groundwork for the English Reformation. It began to inspire reformers in England. Uh, it certainly laid the foundation for the Church of England. And then the Puritan and Separatist movements uh, took their uh, guidance from the Bible, and so did the English Baptists. We're going to find that having the Word of God available uh, to read and to study led to the, uh, the discovery of believers' baptism by immersion, which fueled the origin of the English Baptists, who uh, obviously are our spiritual forebears. So, uh, it has been, I, I think, a good uh, and worthy endeavor for us to study the origin of the English Bible, how we got the English Bible, because as we move forward now to talk about the English Reformation, we'll see the necessary foundation of the Word of God for the advancement of the Reformation in England, and that will be the subject of our next lecture together. All right, so thanks for your attention. I'll see you again very soon.